Welcome to the SJ Child Show, where a little bit of knowledge can turn fear into understanding. Enjoy the show. Hi, and thanks so much for joining the SJ Child Show today. I have a new guest, Angela Meyer. I hope I pronounced your last name right. I just kind of phonetically went off the bat there. We haven't really spoke about it, <laughs> but uh, it's nice to meet you and have you here today. And I'm really excited to jump into our conversation. So tell us um, an introduction and a little bit about yourself today. Well, first of all, I'm a mom, just mm-hmm. like you. And I have a son that has autism. He um, actually, his birthday is two days away. It's oh, on 16. He's going to be 15. Day. Yes. Very excited about that. I am also a clinical certified hypnotherapist. Been doing this for a little over 20 years. I've been voted the best in my area for the past 12 consecutive years. Congratulations. Which is really great. Yeah. I'm an, um, I'm an author. I'm a wellness coach. I, I work with, I have a podcast. I blog posts, blogger. I, I work with people all over the globe, various ages and, um, backgrounds, religions, y- you name it. And I just, I really love what I do. And I, I'm very passionate about this subject, autism, because I have a child with it. Mm-hmm. And as you know, um, there's a lot of learning that takes place. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of learning. And as we were just talking, I was teaching you something new. And yeah. I was like, <laughs> you could teach me something new, but there's just, there's, they're wonderful, just amazing um, children. And I just, I'm very thankful to, to be here today and to be talking with you. So. Yeah, you as well. And I agree the the amount of, um, anecdotal stories we can share and information we can gain from hearing other stories and sharing is so valuable to families and parents. And, um, you know, I think it's so important on our journey that we, like you have a son, almost 15, mine are 11 and and 13. And it's so important that we have these relationships and connections with people on different parts of the journey. You know, one at the beginning of the journey to maybe help them and give them more information that we've gone through, you know, somebody on our same uh, space in the journey to really click heads with and say, oh gosh, what's happening? We're hitting puberty here. You know, help me, help me. (laughs) And then someone like yourself, who's a little bit further ahead in the process. And you can say, what does high school transition look like? What does this, you know, um, what are these things that we can kind of look forward to or look for maybe even? (laughs) And, you know, I think it's important to share all of these so that we can help all of these families and build this community that I have found so much inclusion and friendship and connection. And, um, how do you feel about that? I feel there's a, there, there is a lot. There's like, there's so much that you, you can uh, unpack. And when it comes to autism, I think the, the biggest thing is, is really let's say having an IEP, doing the early intervention program, and really being an advocate, I would have to say for your kiddo, like what, what do they seriously need? So for a a big, big example, and that is where I live, they have a really great school, it's called um, Roberts Middle School and Roberts High School. And in that school, they only have 100 kids. Mm. That's it. And, um, and pretty much all the kids have an IEP and it is a fabulous program. It's so interconnected and more one-on-one attention. So why I'm bringing this up is when my son went to general ed, you know, middle school, the school that he was in had over 3000 kids. It was so sensory overload for him. It was way, I mean, it was even overload for me. And when the bell rang, it was like a sea of kids going down the hallway. And it was so overwhelming for him. So what 
I, I suggested in the IEP is get them out five minutes before the bell is going to ring. Mm. Walk, have a kid walk him to his next class and have him in there. Yeah. And um, and then same thing, like he gets out five minutes early before the sea of kids because it was just too much, too much for him. And when COVID hit, it was it was really scary. He did not want to go back to a school that big. Yeah. And so that's when we found out about, you know, this other middle school and then the high school. And it was the perfect match. I love that. Perfect. Yeah, it was like it was ideal for him. And I if if parents have anything like that in their community, listen, look into it. Now, I do have one thing that is really, I think, critical for any parent with autism is they do have what they call behavioral classrooms. I'm not a big fan of those. And why I'm not a big fan of those is, as you know, kids with autism, they pick up on everything around them, everything around them. So if you're getting in an argument with someone, they're going to feel that anger. They're going to feel that energy and they can start acting out. And so when we put our kiddo in the beginning, like in um, elementary school in one of those behavioral classrooms, it was a nightmare. It was so bad. It was really, really bad. And they pick up bad habits from these other kids. But the most important thing is why I'm sharing this is a lot of those behaviors that he started picking up it was nothing to do with autism, period, nothing. It was trauma-related behaviors, yeah. but no one was trauma-informed. And yeah. so, because the thing is, is our kid still has autism, but he doesn't have the behaviors. So what was it? Was it trauma or was it autism? Mm -hmm. It was trauma. And so if your child starts acting out with certain behaviors that might seem that they are considered autism behaviors, double check and just make sure because sometimes these kids can't use their voice like we do. Mm, they absolutely. can't express, they can't verbally say I'm experiencing anxiety mm. or I have knots in my stomach or I'm feeling depressed or I don't feel safe. It's really, really important to, you know, slow down and connect with your kid and 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 talk to them and really and oh there's books out there too that have images that that's when my son was sort of nonverbal in the beginning we would point at the images in the book like are you feeling angry and he could nod his head are you feeling sad are you feeling frustrated are you jealous you know all these emotions so Mm -hmm. um, finding whatever resources and tools you, you can, um, and books, books are great, great resources for kiddos. Absolutely. And you being an author, you can understand the importance of educating, you know, those on subjects that are you're passionate about and that help the community. And I always, um, you know, kind of voicing that behavior is communication, all oh, behavior, yeah. all human behavior is communication. And once we focus on the communication behind the um, behavior processing, then we can help navigate and create more success for our kiddos and help to, you know, find tools for them to start using on their own, which I'm sure you do a lot of in your, you know, coaching and things like right. that and with, with that. So um, I think it's so important, those things that you're saying, and it's so, um, parents sometimes don't realize how much power they have in both directions, kind of like you're saying, how much they can avoid the trauma of the situations that they seem to be guided into by trusting school district or, you know, right. trusting people, but always do your own research, always double check, you know, facts or ask more questions. Yeah. Yeah. And really, and then that's, yes, ask more questions because a lot of times kids, kiddos with autism, they won't tell you really what's bothering them because they're trying to figure out themselves 
what's bothering them. And, and, and even like with, with, with kids, like for my kiddo, he, he overshares Mm -hmm. some, some kiddos don't overshare. My kiddo definitely overshares. (laughs) I Um, have that problem myself. (laughs) And sometimes they don't know personal space. Yeah. And so my kiddo, the same personal space. And then, um, what's another one is always want to talk about what they want to talk about. Yeah. And so it's trying to teach them, you know, Hey, well, that person wants to talk about other things too. You know, can we, it's like playing with your toys. Can we share? They get to have their share time. You get to have your share time. Yeah, definitely. And it's so important that we give it such a fine line. You have to teach them the skills they need to communicate with other children. And you need to, I guess it's a, it's a three-way line. You need to teach the other children how to communicate better with them. And you also need to teach them or uh, accommodate their needs when they are, um, you know, different than their peers or their siblings. And that's such a fine line to kind of give attention to every place that's needed. (laughs) Yes, definitely. Um, it's, when did you decide you were going to um, help families out in this way and doing like hypnotherapy? I've, I've been doing hypnotherapy since I mean, my mom and I went when I was a child, maybe like 12 on. So it's been a regular, wonderful thing in my life that I completely love and, and um, have had so much success with. Yeah, I grew up with... Um meditation, creative visualization. So I I grew up really with that kind of a background. And when I landed into hypnosis, it was like just the the perfect fit. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it actually it kind of it just, I I sort of stumbled uh, upon it. (laughs) And, um, And I worked for a a company that was called Positive Changes Hypnosis. Hmm. And at that company, the owner wanted everyone to be trained, you know, in in hypnosis. And so I got trained and it was just a, a natural for me. And I loved how... I I don't want to say it gave, I don't want to say it, it removes blocks. It's almost like sometimes it helps remove whatever is limiting you or sabotaging your life. Mm. So, I mean, you can use it for, you know, weight loss, stop smoking, addictions, um, insomnia, surgery, um, people with cancer, you can, you can use it for childbirth. There's so many, I mean, when I gave birth to my daughter, I, there was a book called hypnobirthing and, and I did the, the process. I, we did that too. <laughs> yeah. And it was amazing. It worked yeah. great. And that was before I even became, you know, a, a hypnotherapist. Yeah. So it was, it was really nice to just be able to use the power of my imagination and my mind to create the positive results that I, that I wanted. Mm-hmm. And and it's amazing because I've helped people with with PTSD. I, I mean, I had one gentleman that had pancreatic cancer the second time, and um, and his cancer went away. Wow. Yeah, I mean, there's some amazing things you know, that happen, and I've 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 had some clients say, you know, you saved my life. I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be here without you. And so, to me, it's really rewarding to give these tools to people because I'm only, I I'm only the tour guide. They're the ones that are taking the journey. And that's the real big thing I want people to realize is you can't force anyone to do anything they don't want to do because you have to relax and slow your brainwave patterns down to create access to your subconscious mind. Mm. Have you been able to, had your son been able to participate in it? Oh yeah. Oh, that's great. What kind of um, successes or what has happened for him? Is that okay to share? Oh yeah. For him, I have, I've worked on trauma for him. I've also worked on um, anxiety and I've worked on um, social anxiety as well. 
I've worked on his self-confidence because he did struggle with some self-confidence, you know, areas. Definitely for insomnia, I helped mm. him in that area as well. And what was the other one? I know there was one more that I helped him with. Um, maybe it was, it was a, a, I know, well, I know for my daughter, I helped her with fear of spiders, oh. fear of driving, good um, confidence driving, you know, in a motor vehicle. Um, she once was going to be put back into kindergarten when she went to first grade. I said no. So I helped her with her reading speed and comprehension and confidence there to where she wasn't yeah. put back a grade. Um, there's many different, you know, areas you can you can work in. But the thing is, is they have to be willing to do it. You know, they literally because it takes 30 days for a new habit to become a permanent behavior. So if you did hypnosis just once, it's really a band-aid mm -hmm. and band-aids always rip off. And so that's why I tell people, you know, you created this habit over so many days, so many weeks, months, years, you need to give yourself at least 30 days every day to listen to it. And the best time I tell people is when you're getting ready for sleep, mm -hmm. you can play it out loud in your room. That's what the, a lot of parents do for their kids is they play my stuff out loud in the room and and the the kiddos love it that's but, great yeah i had one girl that listened to some of my free stuff off i think it was youtube and her mom contacted me and it's been like over 10 years she's been listening to me <laughs> and she wanted wow. yeah she's in um i think she's like in eighth grade right now but she was like my daughter loves this recording she doesn't want it to go away so i just ended up sending it you know, oh yeah them, but yeah it's fantastic there's, there's lots of things you can you can do to help help your kiddos oh I love that and what about we were kind of touching on this earlier um that you might be able to help with or like our eating like what do we how do we help a kiddo with sensory uh texture yes that's like that it's tough. It wasn't until recently that my son um, decided to try different things. Mm -hmm. And so you, you got to listen to them. So like, for example, he doesn't like blueberries or he doesn't like grapes, but he loves blueberry pancakes. He loves blueberry waffles. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't like the skin. Yes. So it's finding creative ways that you can incorporate that stuff. So he loves watermelon. He likes cantaloupe, honeydew. Um, I know, you know, that's seasonal, but when you have it, buy mm -hmm. it, give it to your kid and just say, hey, just try this. How does it taste? How does the texture feel in your mouth? Mm -hmm. And then just listen, you know, really listen to them and, and see what they say. So like my son won't eat an apple but he loves applesauce. Yeah. And he loves apple pie. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's kind of figuring it out. So, um, like my, I, my, I introduced my son to curry swordfish and he mm. loves it or, you know, like curry salmon or teriyaki salmon, but it's just the way, you know, making sure the way that you, you cook it and you, you know, give it to them is 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 trying it and some kids like here's a good example he does not like mashed potatoes but he loves roasted potatoes hmm. yeah yeah so it's just finding different ways that you can give them the healthier stuff he loves he loves broccoli and so i i give him broccoli or he doesn't like cooked carrots but he likes raw carrots so he likes them you know in a little you know, dressing dip that you can yeah. give him. And he has, he has that. Cause I think a lot of, or at least my kiddo, he likes crunchy stuff. Hmm. And so the, the crunchiness of the carrots, he, you know, he, he really enjoys that. And I know this is going to sound weird, but he really likes the seaweed. Oh yeah. My daughter loves seaweed. Loves yeah. it. Yeah, he likes the teriyaki flavor and then there's a Korean barbecue one. So he he loves those 
those two different ones. He mm. loves um, sunflower seeds. Ooh. So I buy those little plastic, um, you know, like snack size containers. So in his lunchbox, he's got, he's got dates. Yeah. He's got sunflower seeds. He's got, um, I know, I know it's, I, I try to do everything healthy. <laughs> he's got the seaweed. He's got his, you know, his peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And yeah. that's the interesting thing is these kids with autism, they will eat the same thing over and over yeah. and over and over and over. It's like, for me, I would go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> oh no. I, I, I kind of, I feel bad sometimes on those days where we're out of his regular foods. And at the same time, I'm like, hmm, he's going to try something new today. He's yeah. going to be out of that uh, you know, potato chip and he's going to try something new. So I kind of look forward to those days and I'm going to try, um, the carrots. Like he is not a fan, a uh, fan of vegetables in any way, but he does like crunchy things. So I'm going to go yes. that route in explaining to him how, what a crunchy treat it is, you know, kind of thing. I love how you said, just listen to them too, because so many times as parents, and I think that um, older generations, I think any generation, because you just learn from previous teachings from your own parents, usually, right. Or grandparents, however you were raised. But I think that there isn't, um, a listen button. There's not a stop and listen enough. And we really need to make that time to do that because oftentimes we miss that thinking kids are seeking attention when they're really looking for that connection. And it's so important that we take that time to listen because in that time we're building that connection with them, which is building trust, which can lead to so much more growth in the future. Right. Because you want to establish a secure attachment with that child. Because if you don't, they're going to have an anxious attachment style, which means they have constant anxiety. And so and when you think about it, when they talk about the different textures in their mouth, it could be sandpaper. It's too slimy. It feels like knives. Mm -hmm. It feels, you know, sharp. It feels. And so when you, you know, ask them to use their words, we really do need to listen because you wouldn't want to eat anything or put anything in your mouth that has that kind of texture. Yeah. And it, you can be able to eat it, but they can't because the way it feels in their mouth, it doesn't mean that it doesn't taste bad. It just means it feels uncomfortable in, mm -hmm. in their mouths. And yeah. so that was, you know, really important. And if your kiddo, has trouble, let's say, communicating, you can write down the certain words, like, does that feel slimy? Does it feel like, you know, sandpaper? And, and you can literally buy a piece of sandpaper and let them feel it. Does it feel like this in your mouth? Mm -hmm. And more of that is, you know, a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, connection and, and listening, you know, to them. And there are healthier snacks besides, um, you know, like potato chips, I was in the store and they had these um, cauliflower stalks and they were crunching and it's like sea salt. And if you, um, and he loves it. I was like, wow, this actually tastes good. And they had the veggie sticks and then they, um, there's, there's many different, you know, avenues. If you, if you have a Trader Joe's where you live, they have these lentil spiral, um, you know, chip kind of cracker things and it it honestly tastes like um frito frito lay yeah you know, corn chips so that's the real neat thing is there is some healthier you know alternatives out yeah. there thank goodness right because we yeah. started our uh, gluten dairy free in about, you know, a decade ago. And there was not a lot of options back then. Um, no. But it, it's really changed since then. And he's been more flexible since then, not with dairy products. And that's, you know, obviously, biologically, can't, you don't know, change those things. But um, with gluten, it has he like gluten pretzels don't seem to bother him now. Um, or anything the way that gluten bothered him in the beginning, right. in the very beginning. So it's so interesting. And you, you know, listen to your children 
watch your children, see, listen with your eyes, you know, pay attention to their movements, to their reactions to things so that you can have a better understanding of maybe what those, um, well, any situation is, is happening, whether it has food related or like you were talking about trauma related from a school incident, um, right. things like that really just watch and pay attention. Uh, tell us about, you said you were an author, so I'm just interested to know what, um, what books you've written and, and things like that, where we can find out more about that. Well, I wrote the book, The Undetected Narcissist, and why I wrote that is in my recovery process and learning more about narcissism, I could not find one book out there where someone told their story. And if you think about it, we have been storytellers forever. I could tell you a story and you will remember it. But if I tell you narcissistic, you know, like, oh, what's gaslighting, projecting, baiting, all that, you'll take it in and you'll, you'll get the information, but you have nothing to apply it to. A story brings it to life and a story sticks. And so this, why I wrote it is I wanted to save lives. I wanted to protect children and families and parents from what I went through because, and I know this shocks everyone when I share this, but for eight months, I lost custody of my son because his dad was able to convince the judge that if he lived with him, all his autism behaviors would go away. And yeah, I know you're shaking your head and everyone, wow. shakes their head. everyone is like, holy cow, because I was blamed for all his behaviors, uneducated and, judge. <laughs> I know. And well, she didn't know much about autism either. Exactly. And he would bait our child knowing that he would react a certain way if he baited him. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's, it, it's not a, it's not a happy story, but it tells you what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. It literally, I, it, I told you from when I met him to when I left him and then how he spent five years plotting how to do this. I mean, he spent over a hundred thousand dollars in legal fees. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, it really is. But, and the I'm thing sorry is, you had to go through that. It is, it's really unfortunate. And, but I look at it is if I can shine a light on a subject because here's the honest truth also, and a lot of people don't realize this, is a narcissist, a sociopath, a psychopath, they're not born that way. We create them. Humans create them. And they're created out of three different parenting styles, a neglectful parent, an absent parent, an authoritarian parent. Mm. And then three other ways is bullying, trauma, and child abuse. Yeah. And so... I want to have compassion, you know, for, for these people, because they are, we're all, we're all human beings, but it's like, if you don't like them, then we need to stop creating them. Yes. And that's why we need to be kinder and have more compassionate and yes. more understanding and, and educate ourselves about mental health and trauma and autism and, and all the, all these things that are important because let's be transparent here. We live in a world of polarity. We're taught right and wrong, good and bad, but we're not taught the polarity of human beings. Yeah. And we need to learn how to communicate with one another. We need to learn how to recognize the signs of trauma or neglect or, you know, or child abuse. We, we need to recognize all this stuff. And when I, speak to people so many people are like I wish I met you 10 years ago 20 years ago you know 30 years ago I wish I was taught this stuff in high school and I'm like yeah we do because when these young minds leave the nest and they dive into the ocean of the world they're going to be swimming with sharks yeah and wouldn't you like to give them a life vest or a, a boat because some are going to sink and some are going to swim. Mm. And I worry about those ones that are going to sink. And those are the ones that are going to be the most vulnerable. They're going to close off from the world and then they can end up becoming narcissistic as, as well, because yeah. 
the way that people treated him was so harsh and so mean. Yeah. And and that was the biggest thing too is in my whole recovery process is I kept hearing hate, anger, fear, hate, anger, fear. And it's like, no, you can't heal coming from a place like that. Mm-hmm. You got there's gotta be love. There's gotta be, you know, clarity instead of confusion. There's there's gotta be, you know, just kindness and compassion. There has to be. And it's and so if you read the book or when anyone reads the book, um, you'll learn a lot about what what I wished I knew. And I tell you in there the mistakes that I made, what what everyone made, because we dealt with over a dozen professionals that were supposed to keep us safe and they couldn't because none of them were educated about trauma or yeah. about narcissism. And that's the real, you know, yeah. sad thing. It is. And it's so often that the um, things that people don't want to look at are more often the times we need to speak most about them and we need to shine a light on them and we need to show um, let's not normalize our narcissism, but let's bring it to the forefront so that, like you said, we can stop creating it. I completely agree with that. What, um, is your podcast called and what is that about my podcast is the same name as the book it's the undetected narcissist and I actually teach you about um can a narcissist change I have a part I tell you how they're created but I also can tell you how they change because I've actually helped some change um I talk about trauma bonding I talk about attachment styles um how to communicate with someone based on their attachment style. I talk about um, trauma signals. I I did an awesome interview that's going to post this week about a, a company called um, Safe Haven, where yeah. it's digital um, digital security boxes. So the number one reason why a lot of people struggle leaving toxic relationships is financial abuse. That's the number one reason. And so this company has created these digital safety deposit boxes that people can put money in there. Mm -hmm. You can put documents in there. And they do that because a lot of times um, an abusive person will try to control your money and or you can't get a bank account or you can't get a checking account or you have bad credit. But with these safety deposit boxes, You don't need to have a bank account. Your credit really doesn't matter. It's literally there for you to put anything important that you would need because they can hold that to you. You know, if you leave and you need, let's say, an important document, well, they can say, well, I'm not going to give this to you unless you do this for me. Yeah. And so it's really about um, educating people and giving them the, 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 the information that they need. And everyone that's listened to it has been like, wow, I've learned so much Yeah, definitely. from you. And it's, and it's all just information to, to help people live a better life, to make better choices. And if you run into someone, you're not going to be blindsided because that's the honest truth. When you don't know who and what you're dealing with, you're going to get hurt. Yeah. And when you have the awareness and you're like, oh, I know what they're doing, you know, they're trying to gaslight me or they're, you know, they're projecting or they're doing this and that. Once you learn that stuff, you're less likely to take it personal and you can respond instead of react. Yeah, absolutely. It's a quote that we say at SJ Childs is a little bit of knowledge turns fear into understanding. And it goes the true, it goes the same for that. You know, knowledge can turn your confusion or not knowing into understanding what's happening to you so that you're not a victim of that anymore. So absolutely. Where can we go and find you? Do you have a website um, where we can go and get all this great information? Yeah, the website is undetectednarcissist.com. And I do have a free book ebook on there that is teaching people. It's called the end game technique. Mm-hmm. It's um, teaching people how to 
stay safe when someone is using reactive abuse. And we see kids do this all the time to each other because kids will try to push their other sibling over the edge to get mm -hmm. them to snap mm -hmm. and to do that. But the thing is, is when someone's using reactive abuse on you, it's, it's rather dangerous because when you get older, you could snap and do something that you can never take back. Yeah. Absolutely. Like even with our words or your actions or your <clears throat> behaviors. And so I teach people to what to do when you are in an abusive situation to, to keep you safe. Yeah. I'm also on um, Instagram, Angela Meyer, UN. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. So I'm on many social media platforms and the book is on Amazon. I think it's like $13.99 and then the Kindle is between like $8.99 to nine bucks. Perfect. So oh, it's, it's available wonderful. out there. Wonderful information and so many different topics and areas that you can, you're teaching and you're helping people with. So thank you so much for all your wonderful services that you're providing. Thank you. Yeah. And I definitely um, wish we had more time. We'll have to have you back on to, to do a follow-up and maybe, you know, cover some more topics, but I look forward to keeping in touch with you and I'm really glad we made this connection today. Thank you so yes, much. Same here. It was my pleasure. Thank yeah. You. We'll definitely be in touch. Okay.